praise the Lord. You know, amazingly, when I was praying for what to share, I got this uh, message to share. And uh, at first I was thinking, doesn't sound appropriate. You know, but we'll see what God is doing. Hallelujah. The message is depression among believers. Depression among believers. And I'm going to invite you to open your heart. Open your spiritual ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. You know, as Christians, we have learned to hide things, sweep everything under the carpet, and pretend that everything is normal. We pretend that everything is okay. You know, recently it's amazing. We've been hearing about even pastors committing suicide. And you begin to wonder, how can a pastor commit suicide? How can a genuine believer get into such depression? What goes wrong? What is the problem? I'm not going to ask any person to lift up your hands. But I know some of us have gone through depression right here in the house. Maybe you haven't told anyone. But you know it's nothing to be ashamed of. Because David, the man after God's heart, he went through times of depression. See, I didn't understand that. I didn't see that. But I love to read the Psalms. Then I hear David say, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And then I began to think, what does it mean when your soul is low, when your soul is cast down? That means David was suffering from some depression. You know, it's easy, it is easy to, to thrive when things are going well. You know, it's easy to come and jump and sing, he's faithful when things are going our way. You know, those songs come freely. But when things are contrary, things don't go your way. Some of us struggle with the faithfulness of God. So as I was waiting on God saying, what do you want me to talk about? What is it, Lord? Then I was asking, God, what is the cause of depression among believers? We can understand depression in the world, isn't it? But what is the cause of depression in the house of God? What is the cause of all this suicide? Not only suicide. We've heard on the news, you know, the WhatsApp news goes all over. Couples murdering each other. What is the cause of depression? Cause number one. Failure to wait on the Lord. Failure to wait on the Lord. Isaiah 40 verse 31. Isaiah 40 verse 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Wow. The benefits of waiting upon the Lord. Renewed strength. You know, depression comes when, our, when we are weak, isn't it? When we've been running and running and not renewing our strength. When we are tired we are wearied, then depression. You just need a little thing to upset you, and it just pushes you over the line. Just a small thing can push you over the line because you are weary. 
They that wait upon the Lord, they have the, the beauty of renewed strength. The Lord shall renew their strength. And renewed strength makes you what? Mount up with wings like an eagle. You mount up above your situation, above your problems, above whatever is happening here. You can rise above that. You can rise above that. You see, David, every time his spirit was low, he would talk to his spirit. Why are you so low, my spirit? Lift up your eyes. Your hope is in God. Look up your eyes to the Lord. Your hope is in God. You know, I think sometimes it's the wait on the Lord. We do not understand what that means to wait on God. What exactly does it mean? You see, for me, I like to know because I can be quoting the scripture, even know it when I'm sleeping. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. It's not going to do you any good if you do not understand what it means. That's why we need to reflect on the word of God. We need to gain understanding, gain knowledge of what it means if you are going to benefit from that scripture. Waiting on God, what does it mean? You know, waiting on God is an attitude of heart. It's not just sitting there and say, I'm waiting on God. You know, there's, there's a, 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 a thing on TV that's called waiting on God. It's like a joke. The old people are waiting to die, isn't it? They are waiting for God because they are old. That's not what the word is talking about. Waiting on God is an attitude of the heart that you need to develop the attitude of trusting God. You need to develop an attitude of, you know, you can't wait on God if you do not know him. You can't. For you to wait on God is because you trust his word. You know that his word, is, his promises are yes and amen. You know that he's not a man that he should lie. You know whatever God has spoken, he shall bring it to pass. So when you wait on God, waiting on God has an expectation to it. You're not just sitting. You are waiting for something to happen. You have an expectation that God is going to do something. That's what makes a difference between those with hope and those without hope. You see, when things are going horribly wrong, maybe my rent is not paid, and I'm, I know that tomorrow is the deadline. They that wait upon the Lord will sit down and say, God, you've been faithful yesterday, you will be faithful today, and you will be faithful tomorrow. Though it tarries, it shall surely come. At the appointed time, for God, you are never late. You are always on time. And when you're waiting, you are waiting because you are standing on the promises of God. You are waiting because you know what the word of God says. And you live by the word. Let me just rephrase and say, the trouble today is that many of us, we do not live by the word. We only quote the word when we are in trouble. And it doesn't work. I always say, you know, there is no 999 in heaven. There is no emergency button. You have to leave the word. You have to believe the word. You have to be a doer of the word. You know, when you do what the word tells you to do, then you can expect God to honor his word to you. So I will be waiting on God to fulfill his promises that he is my provider. He is my deliverer. He will deliver me from that situation. And I'm standing and waiting and say, God is coming. One minute left, God will be on time. And for sure, those that wait upon the Lord are never disappointed. God will come through for you. Whereas the other person who has no hope, 
You see, they're not waiting on God. They are waiting on friends. They are waiting on people. They are waiting on their plans. And their plans fail them. Friends fail them. People fail them. And at the end of the day, they are in bed under the blanket having a pity party. So the benefits of waiting on the Lord is renewed strength, the ability to fly above, to rise above your problems, to rise above your situation, to rise above your circumstances. It is not pretending that you don't have a problem. Some people think that's what faith means. Deny that there's a problem. Pretend that you've got no problem. I always say, imagine Jesus coming to the blind man and say, what did you have me do for you? He say, nothing, Lord, everything is fine. He would have stayed a blind man. So faith is not denying the truth. The third benefit is that you will run and never get weary. What does that mean? Continuity. You continue waiting on God. You know, you continue standing. I was just thinking last night, you know, the difference between David and the whole army of Israel, including Saul, was that David had learned to wait on God. While he was in the wilderness with the flock, he learned to sit and wait on God. He, he got to see God as a deliverer. He got to see God as a provider. He got to see God's mighty power, where else Israel didn't know any of that. And when it counted the most... Everybody was fearful except for David. They that wait upon the Lord. It gives you continuity. You are able to move on in spite of the mountain in front of you. You are able to move on in spite of what is happening in your life. The fourth point is you shall walk and not faint. So you are not only expected to continue, but God grants you the stamina, the ability to run the race, the ability not to faint, because fainting is what causes depression. Am I speaking to somebody this morning? When your situation overwhelms you, you see, that's why I love that song. That says, how does it go? Yeah. Exactly. When I'm overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Some of us, when we are overwhelmed, we have nowhere to run because we have no relationship with God. We have no strength, we have no stamina, we cannot continue, we cannot rise above our problems, and the only solution, the devil comes and he whispers, you've got no reason to live. Just take your miserable life and end it now. And that's why they end up dead. That's why they end up dead. It's a dangerous thing to be a Christian and not have a a relationship with God. It's a dangerous thing to be in the house of God and know nothing of the word of God. It's a dangerous thing to be in the house of God, read the word and not trust what the word says. So that leads me to my second point. My second cause of depression. Lack of knowledge of who God is. Maybe I should have started with that. Because you can't wait on a God that you do not know. Lack of knowledge of who God is. You know, I'm sorry to say there are many churchgoers who have no clue who God is. No clue whatsoever. The only thing you know about God is what the preacher tells you on Sunday. The only thing you know about God is what somebody else tells you. I'm doing a study on the friends of Job, Job's comforters. And my study on it is, what was their sin? What was their sin? What exactly did they do so wrong that God was so angry with them? 
Then I discovered they did not know who God was, but they presumptuously stood and started to speak on behalf of God. And what were they doing? They were giving a false representation of God. And that's why God was angry. False representation of who God is. And I'm afraid to say this is the trouble with the church of today. You know, the people of old, just listen to the hymns that came out of their soul. They knew God. They walked with him. They understood him. And out of the depths of their soul, they would sing amazing grace that saved the rich like me. Out of the depths of their soul. But today's Christianity is so shallow. Today's Christianity is fashionable. Christi today's Christianity, you don't need to know God. You just have to go to church, mark a register, and all is well. And when the problems come your way, you have no leg to stand on. This is exactly what Jesus was talking about. The house on the sand and the house on the rock. The house on the sand collapsed when the storm came. So we are seeing many believers today who are building their lives on the sand because they have not bothered to put their roots deep until they hit the rock. Their roots are so shallow that when problems come, they fail to stand. They cannot make a stand. I mean, if you are forever picking up offenses, you are in danger of perishing. Because that shows how shallow your roots are. Because there comes a time in your life when you should be able to deal and handle impossible situations. There comes a time in your life when you should be able to face challenges and know that my God goes before me. He is behind me. He is on my side. I am protected. He orders my steps. He is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. There comes a time when you know that no harm shall befall me as long as I'm walking with God. Hallelujah. Jeremiah 32 verse 27. You can read up to 35 when you get home. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me. Hallelujah. That's the question. Your response to that question is going to determine whether your house is on the sand or your house is on the rock. If there are things in your life that are too hard for God to handle, you are in trouble. You are in trouble. You know, some of us are so used to dealing with things in our own strength. We go and we pray, oh God, you can see my situation at work, but never mind, Lord. I'm quite capable of dealing with it. You just wait here. When I need you, I'll come back for you. But now, just give me room to do it my way. Do it my way. Because we want our way. We do it our way. But you see, your way is going to lead you to Gehenna. That's what happens. If you always want it your way, you are in danger of hellfire. You know, for me, I love to read the word because it helps me to know my rights. See, when I, when I arrived in this land, then I discovered people have rights. So I wanted to know the rights. I want to know my rights. You know, I, I, I would hear the taxpayer say, I'm a taxpayer, I got rights. And then I went back to find out what are the rights of a taxpayer because I'm a taxpayer too. So when I study the word of God, I begin to find my rights as a child of God. 
I don't want to be like the older son who spent all his life in frustration because he couldn't have a little party. Because he didn't know his rights as a son. And he got bitter when the younger brother had a party. I've been so faithful all my life. You never even gave me one little donkey to kill. I want to know my rights. And God has promised me eternal life. <laughs> but you see, the thing is, the promises of God, they always got conditions attached to them. <laughs> and that's where the problem comes. We want to grab at the promise, but then we find that the promise has got strings attached to it. It's got, you know, it's got a condition. If you will do this, then I will do this. If you will follow my commands, then I will bless you. He has promised in Hebrews 13, 5, he will never leave you nor forsake you. So there is no time that you should ever feel alone, even in your hour of darkness, when the devil has locked you in the dungeon of despair and he threw away the key. Hmm. How many of us have ever watched that, uh, the story of Christian? How many have watched that? If you haven't, I can send you one to watch. Very interesting. I know I watched it with the youth at some point. He was in the dungeon of despair. But his friend Hope was sitting next to him. Can you believe? He's sitting there waiting for a solution when he had the key around his neck. The key given at the cross. He had the key to open doors, but he was prisoned. He was in jail, in a dungeon. He couldn't get out with a key. How many believers are depressed when you got a key to get out of that depression? You allow the enemy to keep you in bondage. Can you believe how he felt like when finally hope shows him? But you got the key, put the key in the door, and he puts the key, and the door opens, and he thinks, I've been sitting here sweating, and I had the key all along. I had the key all along. And how many died in the dungeon with the key attached to them? My people perish for lack of knowledge. My people perish for lack of knowledge. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5. In Matthew 28, 40, he says, I will be with you always. I will be with you always. You know what? I've taught myself to say when I, I whether things are going right or things are going bad. I'm always talking to God because he's with me always. He's with me all the time. Sometimes I life I say people who are seeing me driving, they're wondering, who is, she must be talking on the phone, that woman while she's driving. I'm talking to God. They can't see anyone else in the camp by myself, but I'm talking to God. So when the things go wrong for me, the first point of call is God. What are you going to do about this? What is your first point of call? Ring, ring, ring. My friend, ah, I have a situation. I was just wondering if you could help. No, sorry, I'm out of the country. Oh, dear. Ring, ring. Friend, what about you? Oh, no, I'm busy. I just came from a night shift. I'm sleeping. Friend, don't worry. I'll pray with you. They go and they sleep. They never pray for you. But God, he never slumbers nor sleeps. He's always wide awake. And his ears are always attentive to the cry of the righteous. Be like David. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Hope in the Lord your God. I think I love Matthew eleven twenty eight twenty nine, 29, where God promises, I 
will give you rest. I will give you rest. Hallelujah. That's all we need. God to give us rest for our souls. Because depression comes because there's no rest in your soul. You don't sleep at night. You, you, you counting, adding and subtracting your figures. Hey. Okay, I'm going to shorten this thing. Now, I just want to tell you, show you a picture of what happens when you are not lining up with God correctly. There was a wedding in Cana, John chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. You can go and read that. My time doesn't permit. John chapter 2, verse 12, a wedding in Cana. They invite Jesus, they invite his disciples, and the family is there. And everybody is having a good time. And then the Bible says they ran out of wine. You know, wine represents joy. So let's say they ran out of joy. When they ran out of joy, when you run out of joy, what happens? Low mood starts to come. Depression starts to creep in. They ran out of wine. They ran out of joy. But you know what? I'm questioning myself. How can they be lack in the house when God is in the house? How can they be lack when Jesus is in the house? What happened? What went wrong? Then I realized one thing. They invited Jesus, but not as the son of God. They invited Jesus as the son of Mary. And they brought Jesus in. He was just a guest like any other guest. They didn't recognize him as the Messiah. They didn't recognize him as the son of God. So, although he was in the house, there was lack in the house. Until Mary, having lived with Jesus, having seen the power of God, I mean, don't, do you think that Mary just got up and said, Jesus, just try your powers, you know, just try your powers and make wine for them. He had seen him multiply food at home. And I bet you they made him pray for food every day. <laughs> because they knew that when he blesses, it multiplies. When he blesses, it multiplies. So Mary goes, Jesus, there's a problem. They've run out of joy. They've run out of wine. Do something. And then she runs and says to the people, something very, very important. Gives them advice. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. You see, disobedience. Disobedience is our problem. Imagine now Jesus is saying to these workers, to bring your big, big bowls and pour water in them. And they say, water? People aren't interested in water. They want wine. We're wasting our time. Mary, knowing the mind of humans, said whatever he tells you to do, do not question. Just do as you are told. How many times have you been fasting and praying for something and God has come to you and told you to do something and you refuse to do it? And you continue fasting and you continue praying and nothing happens. You see, as I was looking, he says to the blind man after putting mud on his eyes, go wash in the pool of Siloam. He wasn't healed. All he had was mud in his face. He could have turned around and say, what a wasted time. I thought you were the healer. And now you not only ruined my eyes, now you're through sending me away. How am I supposed to find this pool? I'm blind if you haven't noticed. No, he went ahead. And when he washed, his eyes open. Hallelujah. And I look at Naaman. The prophet says, go to the river Jordan and wash. First he starts 
like you and I. The river Jordan, that dirty, filthy river. Are there no clean rivers in Syria where I come from? I'm not doing going in that dirty river until some wise person said, Master, if you were asked to do a, a great thing, would you not have done it? Why can't you just obey? Why can't you just obey? Then he obeyed. And you know, because God knew how stubborn he was, he had to do it seven times. <laughs> he had to do it seven times to kill the stubbornness in his spirit. That's why some of us, things don't work the first, the second, and the third time because God knows how stubborn you are. So he'll keep you going around seven times before the answer comes. Wait upon the Lord. First time you went around, nothing. Wait upon the Lord. Remember the walls of Jericho. Seven days they were going around the walls. And some people say, this is madness, pure madness. Keep on going. Yes, my feet are walking, but my heart, mm -mm. my heart doesn't agree. Keep on going, second day. Whoever heard of a battle strategy like this one? This is crazy. Well, if I don't walk, they'll probably shoot me, so I'm just going to keep on walking. Third day, fourth day, they were not complaining anymore. They were just too tired of talking, so they were just going. Let me just walk faster and finish. But on the seventh, when they shouted the shout of joy, the war came down. I think God is saying something to some people this morning. Waiting on God is the secret to everlasting joy, to continuity, renewed strength, overcoming depression, being victorious right to the end. You know, as I was praying about this, I could almost see, you know, the road, the highway to heaven. And sadly, along the way, on the sides of the road are the fallen. The mighty, the big names, fallen on the side. The little ones, the unknown, the nobodies, fallen on the side. And very few make it to the finishing line. Very, very few make it to the finishing line. Because what you need is to know your God. Learn to wait on him. Learn to allow him to guide your footsteps. The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. He says, I know my sheep, they know my voice. How? Because they are led by the voice of God. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know where you are this morning. But I'm, I'm done. Mm. My last scripture is James 5, 7. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. Be patient, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. And God likens that patience to a farmer. You know who has to be patient for the ground that received the seed so that the seed will germinate and then the seed starts to shoot up. Can you understand the, the, the patience of a farmer? He waits for months and months for that tree to grow and grow and grow. By the time he's harvesting, he's been waiting a long time. And those without faith thought, this is a waste of time. The harvest will never come. I'm out of here. And they are gone. Hallelujah. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. Let us stand.